My name is Gary A. Gibson and I am your host for the next two hours. Let me start by saying that I don't have sickle cell disease, nor do I carry the sickle cell trait. In spite of that, I am no stranger to sickle cell. Quite the contrary. You see, even though I don't have sickle cell, it has had a very huge impact in my life. That's true because its complications took my wife from me after 12 years of marriage. It also caused her to have a miscarriage that resulted in the loss of our twin babies that she was carrying while in a sickle cell crisis. So all told, sickle cell has taken three lives from me, and I feel the pain of those losses every single day. I currently serve as the president and CEO of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative, a community-based organization that has been serving people with sickle cell for over 45 years. Each day I attempt to transform the pain of my losses into positive energy, energy that is focused on making a difference for those who are battling sickle cell. From being involved with sickle cell for over 40 years, I'm able to say that much progress has been made, but there is still so much work to do. This show is an opportunity to contribute to the ever-expanding dialogue about sickle cell that is taking place all around the world. Our show is about raising awareness, but it is also about so much more. I like to say that sickle cell awareness is important, but we need more than awareness. Those living with sickle cell are already aware. That makes me ask, so what are we doing for them? My answer is, not enough. That's why we've named this show the Sickle Cell Action Network, because awareness without action has very little impact. We want this show to be a source of information and a call to action to help those who must live with sickle cell in their midst. We've designed the show to provide information that is beneficial to patients, caregivers, family members, and friends alike. Most importantly, we want people with sickle cell to know and understand that they are not alone. The Sickle Cell Action Network show features live guests who are health care providers, patients, advocates, and others who are engaged in the fight to eradicate sickle cell and ease its burden on those it affects. Today, we are honored to have two very special guests in studio to talk to us about beating sickle cell day by day. Joining me in studio are Sharon Hatcher Hutchison and Darrell Harris. We're also expecting to talk to Leon Moore, one of our Facebook friends who will be calling in from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. We're honored and thrilled to have them with us today. Before we get to today's topic, however, I want to share some of our upcoming topics with you so that you'll know what we are going to be up to. In future weeks, we will cover such topics as the global state of sickle cell, sickle cell research update, traveling with sickle cell, and sickle cell on social media, connecting the sickle cell uh, sickle cell community, and many, many others. So as you can see, we're serious about sharing valuable information, and we hope that you will join us every week, same time, same station. If you've missed some of our previous editions or wish that you could listen to them again, don't worry. Just go to the Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative YouTube page, and you'll find them there. Now let's get on with our show, and we'll start with this week's edition of Sickle Cell News Update. We have several interesting stories for you today. Um, We always try to find some reality stories and some feel-good stories as well. So I'm going to start with a feel-good story, um, and that one is coming to us from Alabama, the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And the story goes... Originally established in 1995, the Adult Sickle Cell Clinic at University of Alabama, Birmingham, has been working to make important transitions from pediatric to adult care possible. Recognizing their task would require a support network that extends far beyond the clinic walls, clinic leadership looked to the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America, North Central Alabama chapter, known in the Birmingham region as the Sickle Cell Foundation, for partnership in this vital work. Sharon Lewis, the foundation's executive director, remembers attending a meeting where the prospect of raising $1 million for the clinic was discussed. Lewis recalls asking herself, oh, is that all? With that ambitious goal in mind, she convinced the foundation's board of directors to pledge $1 million to the clinic in December 2010. Five short years later, after hosting many successful events and debuting a custom vehicle license plate to raise awareness and funds, the foundation delivered the final installment on its million-dollar promise. Michael Bell, foundation board president, presented the check at a reception in the Wallace Tumor Institute lobby on December 10, 2015. Sharon never asked permission to make this pledge. She, like Dorothy from the Wizard of Odd, Wizard of Oz led us down a yellow brick road, Bell said. Now the UAB Sickle Cell Clinic is a beacon of hope to our community. There really is no place like home. In addition to providing world-class clinical care, one of the most important results of the Foundation's generosity is the addition of a full-time social worker to the clinic's staff. According to Dr. Pascal of UAB, the uh, addition of psychosocial services 
enables us to reach the whole patient. It is a key to both longevity and a better quality of life for this vulnerable population. So great job there in uh, Birmingham for a $1 million check to the Birmingham Adult Sickle Cell Clinic. That's pretty cool. Um, here's a story coming to us from the Times of India. And it is coming from uh, Chandrapur. You'll have to uh, bear with me because some of the pronunciations I'm about to make might get butchered a little bit. But it says, on the eve of the commencement of the three-day grand literary meet, the Sickle Cell Society of India urged the writers present to raise the pen in favor of sickle cell patients of Vidarbra. President of the organization, Sampat Ramteki, has requested the participants to pass a resolution during the meeting demanding express measures for control of sickle cell. Remteki has also submitted a memorandum to Guardian Minister Sudhir Mungatwar, urging him to ensure that the Assembly passes a sickle cell resolution the same way that a re resolution seeking measures to curb farmer suicide was passed during a recent gathering. This meeting is a coveted gathering of highly skilled writers of Vidarbra, he said. It is time for them to raise their voice demanding measures to curb sickle cell that has plagued our entire region and has financially ruined over 150,000 families. Remteki lamented that while the Grand Literary Meet will witness four symposiums, two poetry meets, and various other programs, the issue of sickle cell disease that has affected 80 castes in Vidarbra is not on its agenda and he wants it to be. As per official estimates, there are 13,689 sickle cell patients in the western state, uh, the western India state of Maharashtra, out of which 8,978 are in the city of Vardabra. And that shows you the prevalence of sickle cell in India. There is a city there that has at least 8,900 people with sickle cell um, and I don't think there's that many cities, if any, in the United States that have that many people with sickle cells. So that's quite an interesting story. Um, another feel-good story, uh, Memphis Grizzlies point guard Mike Connolly handed out a big-time assist earlier this week when he accepted a $15,000 donation for the Methodist Healthcare Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center. Orion Federal Credit Union wrote the check on Connolly's behalf for his longtime support of sickle cell treatment. Methodist Healthcare Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center runs a preventive outpatient clinic and Memphis's first dedicated emergency infusion unit for sickle cell patients. The center is focused on delivering treatment advances through on-site research. In this um, story, uh, Conley explained his passion for sickle cell treatment. And he says that growing up you find something that you're passionate about. You think that hopefully there is a day when you grow up you can do something about it. Sickle cell is one of those things I've always wanted to help out with. It's really deep because my family has a couple of people with the disease. So it's been a passion of mine to help not only them, but people around the city of Memphis and the world. So we uh, congratulate um, Memphis Grizzlies point guard Mike Connolly for uh, arranging to have a um, $15,000 donation made to the uh, Methodist Healthcare Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center. The last story I want to cover is um, we have talked on the show on numerous occasions about hydroxyurea. Um, and because this is um, a, a therapy that does seem to provide results, we always are looking for more information about it. Uh, one of the things that is uh, important about this is it is coming from the Journal of Blood Medicine. And this report says that hydroxyurea decreases hospitalizations in pediatric patients with sickle cell SC and sickle cell beta plus thalassemia. That's important because up to now, um, doctors have not really prescribed hydroxyurea for patients with sickle cell SC or sickle cell beta thalassemia. And part of the reason they haven't done that is because it wasn't tested that way in clinical trials. But what they call in in a system of that they call off label doctors have been using hydroxyurea on younger people as well as on people that have sc and S, sb beta thalassemia so this particular research uh, report basically says that the results look like it works even on people with uh, sickle cell sc and sickle cell beta thalassemia 
The conclusion is that the cohort of patients with sickle cell SC and sickle cell beta thalassemia provides additional support for using hydroxyurea in patients with recurrent hospitalizations for pain. A large randomized multicenter trial of hydroxyurea to reduce pain admission should be conducted to confirm this data and pr pr provide much needed evidence based recommendations for this population. Um, so we encourage um, the researchers to continue finding new uses for hydroxyurea uh, because it looks like every time they try it, it has a different, it makes a difference. We've seen it working on patients that have sickle cell SS. Now they're suggesting it does work on sickle cell SC. We've also seen where it might help reduce kidney problems, and we're also seeing where it might help reduce strokes in children. So as promising as it is, it's certainly not the only thing that's out there, um, but we certainly want to see more activity. We'll be talking a little bit more about that actually later. In the meantime, we're going to take a break, and then we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host for the Sickle Cell Action Network Internet Radio Show. If you are impacted by sickle cell disease in any way, whether you are a patient, a caregiver, or a friend, you need to join me every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I promise that you will find our show to be full of information, perspective, and opinion about all things sickle cell. See you Tuesday right here on RadioNext.tv, the Cool Groove site. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary Gibson, your host, and I'm glad you're with us today here on Tuesday, February 2nd, Groundhog Day. I don't know what happened with the groundhog, and honestly, I don't care because I don't believe in it. But I'm going to go ahead and we're going to keep talking uh, with our guest today. First of all, let me welcome um, Ms. Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for having me here. And also, Mr. Darrell Harris. Uh, welcome. Darrell? Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. All right. Um, we like to get started usually by letting people know a little bit about who they're listening to. So I always ask this question. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? How old are you? What type of sickle cell do you have? And we will start uh, ladies first. Sharon? Okay. Um, hello. My name is Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson. And uh, in 1962, I was born uh, with SS disease in a little small town in East Central Alabama called Opelika. Very close to um, Auburn and the University of Auburn State. So I'm pretty sure everybody knows about them, but that's where I was born. Okay. Um, and Darrell? Uh, well, I'm Darrell Harris, born in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm 26 and I have SS as well. Very good. So our show today is about beating sickle cell, and the topic is beating sickle cell day by day. Before we talk about how you conquer it on a daily basis, I think it's important for us to talk a little bit about how it has affected you personally. Um, Darrell, what was it like for you growing up with sickle cell? Um, I, I pretty much I didn't really like having sickle cell at first because I didn't understand it. When it, being as a child, being in and out of the hospital, constantly having pain crisis, the things that I didn't know, I didn't like it. So I guess it it was a curse becoming a blessing now. So I'm now, being 26, I'm older to actually understand more and more about sickle cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, um, Sharon, what about you? What was life like for you growing up with sickle cell as a child? Well, it was um, not only physically challenging, it was also mentally challenging because, uh, as he says, not, not you know, being able to understand uh, why you're going through the pain and, uh, you know, why you're so different from the rest of your peers, then um, that, you know, that's a mental challenge right there within itself. And then keeping yourself, you know, uplifted a lot of times when there's no one there to lift you up, so... It, it was a little bit challenging. Do you think it was challenging for your parents to? I think very much so. Um, having to, um, you're having a child that is sick all the time, in and out. I know that had to be very, very stressful for my mother, you know, and my father, um, not knowing at any point that I could, you know, when I could be sick or 
um, and then having to set aside uh, your daily activities to tend to one child when you may may have other children at home, mm -hmm. you know, and then the other kids too may have went through some mental uh, stress also, mm -hmm. feeling uh, alienated because much much time is given to that child, mm -hmm. you know, with sickle cell. So yes, that's you're you're raising a you're things. raising a point, Sharon, that I don't think gets talked about very much, and that's you know what's the impact on the family. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, uh, rightfully so, talking about the impact of sickle cell on individual patients, but there's a sphere of, of people around those patients, and, and it's the parents, it's the grandparents, it's the brothers and sisters, right. and to some extent, each of them have skin in this game, right? That's right. That's so, what they do. Uh, Darrell, what would, what would you say? What about your parents? Did you, were you noticing anything as far as, you know, them and how they were, how it was affecting them? I notice a lot, especially with my mom. My mom's been in my backbone since the day I actually came. So, and now to this day, my mom's still on my back, making sure, Daryl, take your medicine. Are you feeling okay? She calls her to check on me, like, every single day. Awesome. Good. So if I don't mm -hmm. call her, it's a problem. Make okay. sure she's on top of me. So, especially her and my sister, they're actually, the ones are always on my back. So, okay. Yeah, it's definitely a big difference growing up with sickle cell than it. I mean, I'm pretty sure what it is without having it. I think, you know, in most cases, I mean, your family invests in you, and, and they want you to be um, getting the best treatment, getting the best care, having the best life possible. So so they, they, they play an important role, and I think uh, maybe in a future show we'll talk about that, where, where we talk a little bit more about that important role of the family um, in, in helping make that happen. So, uh, Sharon, are you the only one in your immediate family who has sickle cell? I'm the only one that has the SS. Okay. Um, I have two brothers, and they both have the trait. Okay. And then my two children have the trait. Okay. So being the only girl, I guess, yes, I am the only one. Okay. SS. And what about you, Darrell? Were you the only? Yes. Okay. My son has the trait, so I'm the only one on both sides. Okay. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Uh, yeah. Neither none of them have the actual disease or the trait. That neither. I okay. Okay. Um, good. So um, how much do you remember, Darrell, about the type of medical care that you received as a child? And please tell me about some of those experiences, if you can remember any. Um, to the most part, I remember just about every hospital visit I can imagine. No kidding. Yeah, that just I guess that's how traumatized it is for me. Like, I remember on stuff as far as the sickle cell, I remember every last detail of it. And some of the, some of the stuff I try to blank out and try not to remember it, but growing up as a Riley child, which was also like the amazing hospital that you could have in Indiana right. for me. No disrespect to IU or Methods or Wisher, but right. Riley it was on top of me, and I kind of hated the fact that I had to leave. But that right there was like an experience going from Riley to another hospital, but they actually did take care of me. I loved Riley. Mm -hmm. That was like my second home. Literally, mm -hmm. I can go to Riley and know where everything is. For those listening that may not be that familiar with Indianapolis, uh, because our audience does spread out all over the, the world, um, Riley Hospital for Children is a renowned, world-renowned uh, hospital where um, people that, kids that go there get like the very best treatment. Mm -hmm. um, they get everything, and it's probably like the next closest thing to Disneyland or something mm -hmm. like that, isn't it? Yes, um, they really take care of the kids. They, they, they do everything they can to make them have fun, um, and, and they take good care of them. Um, they bring in all the teams of specialists for every little thing, um, and, and that's why when a couple of weeks ago we talked about the transitioning process from transitioning from uh, pediatric to adult care, and that's a huge part of that where all of a sudden they take that away from you and you have a whole new uh, experience when it comes to getting health care. Um, so a few weeks ago, like I said, we talked about transitioning, and Darrell, you kind of just touched on it, so I'm going to ask you to see if you can get a little more detail here. You got kicked out of Riley, basically. Yes. Um, and that's what happens, right? <laughs> yes, sir. So tell us about that. How was your transitioning experience? You you went from that to what? Um, to me, like I said before, I don't disrespect, but IU and Methodist kind of seem like a downgrade, like the staff members and things at IU don't say that they don't care, but the care that came from Riley to IU was a big difference. Maybe it's just the children, but it just seemed like, I guess, 
when you're at Riley, they're like so innocent, so you have to take make sure they're on top of their pain. Mm -hmm. When you switch over to IU or Methodist or anything like that, the pain that I guess she was saying the adult has is not they're not on top of it as much as they are at Riley. Mm -hmm. So it's a big difference. I know it's a big difference, and I kind of wish I was back as a kid again. I go back <laughs> right, <to> Riley. right. <laughs> Everybody wants to go back, from what I understand. Sharon, do you? Uh, have any comments about the transitioning experience for you? Things were probably a little different because, uh, you know, no offense, you're a little older than Darrell. Things sure. have changed a lot, right? Sure. Well, they have changed a lot. And um, I also was uh, a child prodigy of, of uh, Riley. So I made that transition from Riley into IU, and, well, which was University Hospital at the time. And so making the transition from pediatric care and the um, almost individualized care that you received over there to going into adulthood where now you have more responsibility with your care than you know, right. than the medical staff does. It, it can be very scary, and it was for me also. You know, I'm out here now, and I've got to try to, you know, keep up with um, my medication list. Uh, the doses that I take, I need to know what I'm taking, you know, those type of things. Um, that wasn't my responsibility per se as a child, you know, so there, and then learning how to um, do things that keep you um, as healthy as possible, that was a different transition also. And then when you transition from a pediatric doctor to an adult physician, even the verbiage is, is totally different. Mm -hmm. um, they don't talk to you like, you know, you're still that little kid over at Riley Hospital. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was very, you know, uneasy. It was a, you know, uneasy transitioning, but it wasn't as hard transitioning for me. Um, I just kind of moved into the flow, uh -huh. and as I became an adult, I became a parent. So my transition, you know, <laughs> moving into adulthood was not only with my illness, you know, it was becoming a mother. So therefore, I had to grow up. You know, right. So to speak. Well, when so. we when we had our show on transitioning, we talked a little a little bit about the multifaceted aspect mm -hmm. of it. It's mm -hmm. it's you know it's not just the medical care. It's also you now being in charge of setting your medical appointments. That's it's right. you being in charge of making your medical appointments. It's you being in charge of your insurance mm -hmm. and things like that. It's you right. being in charge of your bills uh, and, and it's you being in charge of getting your prescriptions filled and all of those mm -hmm. things. So, yes. and, and that's a really strong area that we need to stress these days that, um, and, and it's good to see that there's progress being made in this regard, but we want people to, to really put together strong, transitioning program or process for everybody to follow and right. that's what we talked about a few weeks ago so thanks for touching on that with us we are uh, going to take a break and when we come back we will continue our discussion with Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson and Darrell Harris welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network I'm Gary A. Gibson your host uh, the Sickle Cell Action Network is a service of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative and we're very happy to be able to provide you information about sickle cell disease. We are speaking with uh, Mr. Darrell Harris and Ms. Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson about beating sickle cell day by day. And we're just sort of going through the the life as the aspects of life that people have to go through as we continue our discussion. So we're going to go back to Darrell now and say, you know, Darrell. What about your schooling? Did you have a hard time getting through school because of sickle cell? If so, please explain why, and if not, why not? Um, I had a bit of a hard time with school, and like to this day, it's still kind of hard. But um, I had my mother to push me through my schooling because with me being in and out of the hospital, it made me miss actual being in front of the classroom, being in the actual classroom setting, being able to learn with the students. So being able to learn with them, doing the mathematics and things like that, it kind of slowed down my pace. So I'm certain stuff, I'm just not as quick as other people are with certain subjects, but mm -hmm. I did get it done. Mm -hmm. I mean, along with a lot of help and a lot of tutors, I did get it done. Mm -hmm. So it did, did some, a lot of challenges for me, but okay. I'm still working on it. And Sharon, did you, uh, what was your schooling experiences like? Um, during the time when I was at school, um, I had a, I had a hard time um, 
And like Darrell said, uh, one of the things missing a lot of classes, missing time from school, uh, getting behind in your assignments, those are things that, you know, kind of held us back or made it a little slower. And we had to kind of work at our own pace in order to catch up. Um, I remember times uh, being in in home, being in the hospital and having intercom system back in that day. Mm-hmm. I could have an intercom system in, in the classroom and be able to talk with my homeroom teacher. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, um, therefore, you know, in that instance, um, that wasn't all the way through school, but in, you know, some parts of my schooling, I was able to do that, and that kind of kept me, you know, in with the classroom, at least the interaction part I could do. So here's a question that's related directly to the topic of beating sickle cell. Um, Having the setbacks and, and the issues with being able to complete school say at the same pace mm-hmm. as those around you is sometimes enough to discourage people and make them quit yes. um you didn't quit no. why well um i think that um i've always had this this inner strength or um, this belief that um I have sickle cell, and sickle cell doesn't have me. Right. And I, I say that all the time. Uh-huh. This is something I inherit, so I have to just take it and, uh, you know, just uh, work with it. So, And, and I'm going to just work with it, and that's what I'm going to do. I just think that I had a lot of belief, my, my spiritual belief, and then I had people that believed in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family, my church family, uh, my peers, my school my counselors, my teachers, th- these are all people that were, you know, standing there saying, hey, you can do this. I know this is going to be hard, but we're here for you. And I think having, uh, you know, people to support you mm-hmm. and, and believe in you is really, that's a powerful thing. It can yes, kind of help you get through. Right. Even times when you don't think you can make it through yourself, I think you you hear those people saying, we believe in you. Right. You know? So... I think that's what, you know, really helped me get through a lot of it. And Mm -hmm. knowing that somebody believed in me, believed that I could do it. I think that's a beautiful answer. Um, And and I would suggest that if there are any people listening who are caregivers, that they listen to what you just said. You know, one of the best things you can do as a caregiver is provide that kind of encouragement. And there really is no stronger encouragement than someone saying, I believe in you. That's correct. That's true. Darrell, what about you? Uh, to piggyback off uh, Ms. Sharon, yes, mine was pretty much the same thing. That happened to have uh, the actual support and be able to tell that I had to go. I actually had to graduate and make it through school. A lot of times I did. A lot of times I did want to give up. I really wanted mm-hmm. to drop out and just say, forget school. I'm not going to do it. Go get a GED. Mm-hmm. But I guess I took more of the things where people told me that I couldn't do it mm-hmm. just because I have sickle cell. They blamed it on the sickle cell that right. I couldn't do something. So right. I pretty much had to, I had to challenge you and be like, okay, now my sickle cell, I don't, ha- I have, my sickle cell lives with it, but that's not something that's going to stop me. Right. So it's something that's that right. may be pushed harder, like, okay, yeah, I have sickle cell, but a person with sickle cell can still graduate. Mm-hmm. So right. that made me actually push even more and knowing that I had the encouragement and support of my family mm-hmm. and those friends, I'm going to push it through and I wasn't going to stop until I made it. And then when I did, I actually felt a lot better than I would have if I would have just gave up and just dropped out. Mm-hmm. And and as I understand it, you're still actually um, getting some sort of education. You want to talk about that a little bit? What are you yes, doing? Sir. I'm actually going to school for business administration and psychology just to get um, more learning and just not to give up because I want to eventually start my own business and be able to get back to sickle cell, which um, I'm going to do be doing clothing and things that just be able to get back to those who are in hospitals and things like that so that they have a way to not feel like they're alone, um, that everybody has their own coping mechanism. So Mm -hmm. mine is having to be music and family and things like that. So for those who are not able to be there uh, for as far as family-wise, be able to get back and be there with them in some way, Mm -hmm. whether it's music or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I just... I'm not done with school. I think what you just said, too, is striking. You want to give back. And, and Sharon, I, I know that you, too, you want to give back. 
and and you know one thing about giving back is it gives people purpose um and sometimes one of the things that hurts people keeps them from achieving keeps them from going anywhere is they feel there's no purpose and we want people to understand that you can help create a purpose and one of the ways that you can do that is just by giving back so, you know, Sharon, you, you come into Martin Center and, and you help out as and volunteer um, and among other things that you do. And, and that's something that gives you purpose and, and continue to encourage you to do that. Um, but we certainly want other people that deal with sickle cell to, to think like that, too. And, and hopefully you, you can say to yourself, you know what, there is something I can do to give back. And in doing that, you actually help build your life and you help give your life purpose and and that's great isn't it you do i i mean i agree with you um when you do give back it does give you purpose um even just as going into a job you know a lot of times when i was working uh i felt fulfillment Mm -hmm. um and uh so when I, i even though i'm not employed at this moment I still find ways to continue going on, and I keep moving, and I keep giving back, and I try to do as much as I possibly can for other people, because it in turn comes back to you, Mm -hmm. if not um, in a tangible sense, but it gives me the sense that, hey, you know, I've helped, I've helped someone, right? and even if it's just one person that I've touched, then that makes me feel that, you know, I've done something, I've done something wonderful. You know, right. and that keeps me going. That's my inspiration. Is when I'm able to give back and help other people. That's the inspiration that keeps me me going and living. Right. And not just you know sitting down and folding and saying okay I give in. And Darrell, you too have uh, come and volunteered at Martin Center a few times too. So you know you know what that's about, and and you know it's you know as I've said before I think on the show in in my opinion you know we are not here for ourselves we are here for others Uh, we are all here to serve someone else Mm -hmm. welcome back to the sickle cell action network i'm your host gary a gibson and i am president ceo of martin center sickle cell initiative martin center sickle cell initiative is bringing you the sickle cell action network every tuesday from 4 to 6 p.m eastern time and we are doing that because it's a part of our effort to educate and to advocate uh, for those who have sickle cell disease. Martin Center is a 46-year-old community-based organization in Indianapolis, Indiana. We provide a wide range of services to people who uh, have sickle cell disease, including a support group, a food pantry, uh, transportation assistance, emergency financial assistance, and general uh, counseling services. We um, also uh, provide education at uh, numerous health fairs throughout the year. We work on newborn screening follow-up and let people know that their children have tested positive for sickle cell trait, and we try to explain that to them. Um, And, as I said, we advocate. And the Sickle Cell Action Network is a part of our advocacy efforts. We thank you for being with us today. Um, with us on in studio is um, Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson and Darrell Harris, and we are talking about beating sickle cell day by day. Um, and in order to let the audience know the full picture, we're just sort of going through life and and talking about how sickle cell has impacted them in their lives. And so I think what I'd like to do now is is take the topic towards work experiences. Um, what types of jobs have you had, uh, Darrell, in your past uh, past experience here? I've pretty much had a little bit of every type of employment I can find, but it seemed it doesn't really seem to last very long, only because of sickle cell. Mm-hmm. And with a lot of stuff, well, having sickle cell crisis and not knowing when you're going to go into one, it pretty much makes the work day or that type of employment that you find hard to deal with because you don't know you being at work and your day can go start off perfectly fine and end miserable mm-hmm. or it can be the opposite way around it mm-hmm. like that kind of makes it hard, uh, life do with sickle cell a little bit harder especially in the work experience mm-hmm. you know people that um have sickle cell or people that have families um or family members of people that have sickle cell understand what you just said 
um, average people that don't know very much about sickle cell won't understand that, you know, and they'll think so, so, oh yeah, you've got this disease, so why can't you work? You know, what is it about sickle cell that, that makes it difficult to work? Um, the level of pain that you can have, like you can go outside and start off with a sunny day and your, bur your body can be perfectly fine. And then for whatever reason, the weather change or the climate change in your work environment can completely throw off your whole body sitting. You can just go into a crisis. Your body just is that sensitive that we don't know when our body can go into a crisis. So that makes it a lot harder for us mm -hmm. not knowing when our body can change. Mm -hmm. So, Sharon, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, I agree with you. And uh, just like um, I've worked in... Uh, positions where I worked in the office a lot and I can you know clear my desk on on a Tuesday and go in on a Wednesday morning and maybe have a stack of papers and just even not knowing that my level of stress has elevated because of I'm looking at the workload that may be on my on my table uh, knowing that I can get it finished but just the stress of knowing when I left the day before it was clear that can also throw your body off and throw you into a crisis so you know not only does the climate and the um, atmosphere you know change it can be just, just something simple things. as stress mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something simple as stress um, going to work and maybe running out of gas or you know just anything can happen that can just throw you off and you can go into a crisis immediately and so at any given point as you've had the jobs that you've had, Darrell, um, what would you say about your employers? I mean, did you have difficulty getting them to understand what was happening with you, and, and would they play along with you or not? Uh, some jobs I actually did, because I, before I actually took the position, I would tell them I actually have sickle cell. I would ask them about the climate that I'm going to be dealing with, the, what, the workload, the stress, the type of things like that. And before I went into taking the job on, some of them were like, well, We'll, th we'll work with you as far as everything that you uh, we have to do with as far as your work. Other jobs, well, no, we're going to pass on you. Okay. I mean, it's just something that comes mm -hmm. along with the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative, we're embarking on a brand new project called Emergency Department Sickle Cell Education Project. We're doing this because we're tired of hearing about the lack of knowledge and cultural insensitivity of emergency department staff. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe your experiences as an adult in the ER, Darrell? Um, to this day, I hate the experience of going to the emergency room. Like, I, me being a sickle cell patient, I would much rather suffer at home than going through the emergency room sometimes. I would only get to the have to seriously go as if, to me, I can't take it at home. But to me, so much lately I tried my best not to go because going in there some of those make you feel like you're a drug addict or you're only here because um, the, the actual me uh, medicine they give you not because you're in pain because of the ones who've actually been there so many times who who's messed it up for those who are sincerely in pain mm -hmm. so I try my best not to go because I don't want to be labeled as a drug addict or whatever it is I'm only going because I'm in pain that's just simply as that mm -hmm. And Sharon, you, what, what about your emergency room experiences? Um, my emergency room experiences have been basically the same as yours. Um, you get there, and a lot of times, you know, one of the big questions that I get is, um, well, did you take anything before you got here? You know, and um, actually that's, that would be a question that, you know, should never come up because of course you've tried to do what you could possibly do at home before you've arrived and uh, and then if you're you know not sometimes I'll go and uh, my pain tolerance might be a little higher than some people so I may get there and they can they'll look at me and say oh well she's not in that much pain but I could be at a 10 and that doesn't necessarily mean that my pain isn't as severe as someone that's just crying or falling on the floor or, you know, a broken arm or, uh, you know, a busted leg. It doesn't mean that my pain is not as important. And so I agree. The care has not been the same. Uh, the experience is not the same as it would be with someone else. Um, you, you're right. We get labeled as... Um, drug seekers and I think that that's a poor label to give anyone um, 
if a person comes in and they're in a lot of pain, uh, of course you should be more, you know, uh, sympathetic or even empathize with that person. I mean, think about what if this was your mother or your sister or your brother that is coming in to an emergency room and someone just treated them like that. How would you feel? You know, and I don't think that they they put on those shoes to think about, you know, how it would make them feel if one of their family members or even themselves, you know, at some point, just because you're a caregiver does not mean that at any point you couldn't be the person on the other side of that fence. Well, and that's exactly why we're taking on this project and we're working with the Indiana State Department of Health to do this. Um, we convinced them that there was a need. Mm -hmm. They see the need and now they're working with us and our idea is that through um, a, a really strong outreach effort with the emergency rooms were able to improve uh, responsive t response times, mm -hmm. uh, try to minimize the characterization of the drug, drug seeking addicts that you just talked about, mm -hmm. trying to improve cultural sensitivity. Those are all three things that we're trying to accomplish with this project uh, mm -hmm. because apparently that need is there and it's, it's, it's a need that we see is happening all around the country. So right. uh, that's why we wanted to talk about that. One of the least talked about impacts of sickle cell is the financial burden that usually comes with it. Um, I've spoken to many patients who have thousands and thousands of dollars of medical debt. Is that true for you? Um, and if so, how do you manage that? And if not, why, why not? Sharon? Uh, yes, that holds true. Okay. Um, I remember when my husband and I first got married, and this was back in the 90s, um, I was in the hospital for 10 days, and we had a hospital bill that was almost three. Th Three hundred thousand right. dollars, and so yeah, that's devastating on a family, and especially you know if you don't have, um, you know, a good insurance plan, then that can be that can just wipe out your account. You know, it can wipe out everything. It puts you in uh, in depression mode. Um, you know, your stress levels are up. Um, it makes you more vulnerable to uh, having more more sickle cell crisis. Um, just trying to deal with just that you know little area of mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. coming with the hospital bill so it's it's been stressful on me too um, having to um, support the kids you know and and just everyday living clothes food you know housing and then you've got the high medical bills on top of that yeah it's, it's very devastating sometimes and Darrell what about you um one of the actual blessed ones. I'm actually, um, it was actually okay for me as far as the medical debt side of it. Okay, um, why was that? I, I'm assuming just the medical plan I have set up. I'm okay. so close with some of my actual primary care doctors okay. that I make sure that I'm on top of the plan that that are joined with them so that I know anytime I'm in the hospital or I need something, I'm well enough connected to them. Okay. As far as medical side, um, it's just the plan that they put me on that just having to be a blessing that I don't have to worry about that. Okay. It's, it still is a big problem. It is you know, a big It's problem. a big problem, and it's one that people don't talk about that much, but we, we want to talk about it because we want people to realize that this is a problem. Right. Um, yes. When you see, um, and, and this is one particular case, I, I saw uh, a, a, a parent of a child with sickle cell who pulled out uh, an envelope and then it was it was like two and a half inches thick of bills mm -hmm. and she's like I don't know how I'm going to do this right. and that really struck me as as a real issue so um, thank you what is it how do you manage that stress then that comes with it Sharon I mean you mentioned it it's stress so how do you manage that how do you beat that stress well um, I think sometimes um, you feel that you just do what you can do uh, one of the things is finding a good insurance plan that works for you um, and making sure that the medications that you take, you need to definitely look into making sure that you have a plan that covers those medications because you can also get into trouble with having a good medical side of it, but then you have right. the side that doesn't cover your medications. Right. And your medications can run, you know, on a monthly um you know, into the hundreds or even thousands right. of dollars at a time. Right. And if you're on a fixed income, as most, you know, patients uh, with sickle cell are on a fixed income, mm -hmm. then that 
you know, gets to be devastating and that's stressful too. So I try to make, I've made sure that now uh, the insurance coverage that I have actually covers the uh, specialty doctors that I have to see. I make sure that my um, uh, prescription plan definitely covers the medications that I have to take. And if they don't cover, you can always go to your physicians and talk to them. They do have people that are on board with them. They're, they have counselors there that can talk to you and sit down and talk to you about your prescriptions and how we can work in getting some of the, a lot of times the manufacturers will help cover the cost. Right. So reach out to them. If you don't just you know sit back and say, hey, I can't pay for this and not take your medications. Definitely make sure you talk to your physicians about this so that, that way they can kind of put you in the right place to talk to someone to get the help you need. So one of the tactics for beating sickle cell day by day when it comes to the financial stress mm -hmm. is actually taking charge. That's it's right. actually being proactive. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, talk to people. Tell them, hey, I, right. this is a problem. Um, and certainly um, I'm sure that many people listening realize that inside those hospitals are mm -hmm. social workers. Mm -hmm. Get them. That's what they're there for. Talk to them. You know, right. this is going to be a problem. Help me figure out how I can do this. Right. That's not going to happen if you don't say it. That's right. And don't look at this as a weakness. It's not. It doesn't mean that, you know, you're weak or don't worry about if someone's looking at you and it makes you feel like, well, I'm poor and I can't afford this. Don't worry about those things. The most important things is making sure that you ask for help. Help is out there, and if we don't ask, we will never receive it. That's why we fight so hard now and with the show and everything, trying to get the word out. Is because if people don't ask, we will never know. That's right. We'll never know. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Darrell Harris and Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson, and they are here for you. Um, just as I am and just as the Sickle Cell Action Network Internet Radio Show is, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue this great discussion. Do you or does someone you know have sickle cell disease? Have you heard about the EPIC study? It's an international research study evaluating an investigational drug aimed at shortening the duration of painful crisis. And with over 50 sites in the U.S., there may be a site near you. To learn more and to find out if the EPIC study is right for you, visit www.theepicstudy.com. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. The Sickle Cell Action Network show is sponsored by Mass Therapeutics, a publicly traded by a pharmaceutical company headquartered in San Diego, California. Mast is currently leveraging the molecular adhesion and sealant technology platform derived from over two decades of clinical non-clinical and manufacturing experience with purified and non-purified palaxomers. MAST has developed a drug called MST-188 as a candidate for serious or life-threatening diseases with significant unmet needs. Among those needs is the treatment of sickle cell disease. MAST is currently enrolling sickle cell patients in a clinical trial known as EPIC. EPIC stands for Evaluation of Purified Palaxomer in Crisis. If successful, EPIC could result in the first treatment of its kind to treat sickle cell disease patients while they are in crisis. The EPIC study aims to determine whether MST-188 can shorten the duration of a painful crisis. MST-188 is an investigational drug that has not been approved for commercial sale in any jurisdiction for any use. MST-188 potentially improves oxygen delivery and it may help keep blood vessels from becoming blocked and more obstructed. It may improve blood flow by stopping cells from grouping together. It may also reduce inflammation and it may restore cell membranes and give damaged cells time to heal. Interested patients should know that EPIC participants will receive their normal pain treatments during crisis and that there is no cost to participate. Interested patients should also know that participating in this study could not only help themselves, but might also help future generations of those yet to be born. If you're interested in learning more about the EPIC study, please visit www.theepicstudy.com. We are back to talk with Mr. Um, Darrell Harris and Ms. Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson about beating sickle cell day by day and want to give a shout out to some of the tweets that we're getting here today. Uh, special shout out to P. Allen Jones um, out there in California. 
Uh, P. Allen Jones is the author of a great book about living with sickle cell called I Only Cry at Night, and I encourage everybody that's listening to pick up a copy of I Only Cry at Night by P. Allen Jones. Thanks for listening, Miss Jones. Also, a shout out to Mr. Addison Simpson, who has tweeted in and says we're doing a good job. Thank you, Mr. Simpson, for all that you're doing for our community, and thank you for listening to the Sickle Cell Action Network. So, another issue that sickle cell patients face is in finding companionship. How has your life unfolded with regards to that, Sharon? Well, um, finding companionship, I think when I was uh, in my younger years, uh, dating was, you know, some sort of a, I don't know, I think you don't want to, you know, just come out and explain that you have sickle cell right off the bat. So um, you have to find that right timing, you know, for everything. And then a lot of times when it was expressed that I had sickle cell, um, the other person would shy away. because, And, you know, um, at that time I was young and I didn't understand why. But now looking back over that, um, a lot of times people can't handle the pressure of, you know, um, dealing with someone that is ill because that takes a lot of time. It ta- it's, takes a lot of, um, it just takes a big person to be able to accommodate someone that they're going to have to, at some point, tend to 24 hours a day or, you know, all of their life. And for the rest of your life, that's that's a big, that's a big issue. Sure. So, um, but I was fortunate to be married at one point, and um, I was married for a while. So, um, not everyone, you know, has a heart that says, uh, I can't handle that. There are big people out there that says, hey, okay, we can fight this, and we can do this together. Mm-hmm. And when you find that person, you know, when, that says, hey, I can do this with mm-hmm. you, then that makes a big difference, too. It makes That's a world wonderful. of difference. It's wonderful. So. What about you, Darrell? Um, piggyback off of what Ms. Sharon said, I'm, it's basically the same way, just trying to find the right timing and the right person to deal with the, um, who's going to understand your sickle cell and know what it is to actually be with someone for a long period of time to actually go through it. Um, so for me, um, finding someone who actually has it, I'm glad I actually found my best friend who who actually does the same exact thing. She makes sure that I'm actually healthy and Basically, she treats me like I am her child when it comes to my sickle cell. So it makes it not so much as an issue. It kind of makes it more of she understands my pain. Mm -hmm. So it's like it doesn't hurt so much to go to her and say my back hurts or whatever part of my body is hurting. She makes sure that I can calm down before I get to the hospital because that's one thing we don't like going to the hospital visit, I mean, taking hospitals, especially knowing how we just touched on the emergency room visits, Right. I try to make sure we take care of that at home. So mm-hmm. the less stress keeps me happy, basically doing things like that, it makes it a lot easier. But as far as the ones in the past, it kind of just, I didn't like talking about it either. Like that was one thing I wouldn't li- literally not talk about at all unless mm-hmm. basically I'm in the hospital and my mom calls, or they call my mom, and that's how they would find out I actually have sick. So I would not. Talk you wouldn't about tell it. people. No, I don't like talking about it because okay. it's like talk about it, and you're gonna shy away. It's like mm-hmm. I try my best not to push people away when it comes to that. So I would rather not talk about it until it's absolutely necessary to talk about it. Okay. okay. So I think a lot of people shy away out of fear because um, of the unknown. If you don't don't know and you don't understand or you've never been faced with um, an illness like sickle cell um, or anything longevity like that then people really don't understand what we go through on a daily basis so it's easier for them to walk away or shy away from something that they don't really understand you know and there's so many misconceptions out there you know if you've actually heard something that might not be true you know about sickle cell then that tends to make people shy away also mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um. It's it's an understandable thing um, because sometimes people shy away because of fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They don't know what they're getting into, or or they Absolutely. have an assumption of what they're getting mm-hmm. into. Absolutely. Um, and in some some cases, um, 
those that actually do shy away or do leave, they probably have missed out on something, mm-hmm. I think, because, Sorry. you know, That's people right. that are sickle cell warriors are incredible people, mm-hmm. and there is a lot that people can gain from relationships with them. And so if someone shies away and says, um, Man, I can't deal with this, then perhaps one way to look at that is it's your loss. That's right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, so I think it's amazing that so many people still know so little about sickle cell. Um, if you had the chance to sit down and talk to President Obama or a congressional committee, what would you tell them about living with sickle cell? Sharon? Well, I would just let them know that um, sickle cell actually affects every aspect of our life. Uh, Financially, it's it's burdensome. Um, Mentally, it's stressful. Uh, Physically, it's tiring and painful. But um, the one thing that I really want them to know is that I wish they would be able to, um, I wish that we could have the same type of equality or coverage that uh, some of the other diseases have out there. So that that way people can understand. And I think if if, um, with the president or the committee being who they are can get the word out that sickle cell does exist. It is painful. It is hurt, hurtful. Some, and it, you know, it affects these people the same as breast cancer, the same as um, Alzheimer's, the same as, you know, it, not in the exact same way, but in the same aspect. I mm-hmm. mean, we, we just, you know, we're on the back burner, and this has been for decades. Mm-hmm. And it's time that we come to the forefront mm-hmm. because so many of us live with that. Mm-hmm. And that would be one, the one thing that I would want them to know. Okay. And I would, you know, want to express to them that we really need to get this out here. Mm-hmm. We need to let people know that it's okay. You know, if you're living with this, don't hide behind it. Let's all, you know, get together and band for this. Mm-hmm. We, we, we deserve the right to, to feel better, to have the same type of um, health care. Mm-hmm. We deserve to, to not uh, be stigmatized or, mm-hmm. or felt like, you know, we're seeking something that we're not. Mm-hmm. We deserve that, and we deserve the same respect as all the other types of illnesses. So, Darrell, uh, President Obama has invited you into a seat in the Oval Office, and you're because he wants to know more about sickle cell. Um, what are you going to tell him? Um, pretty much the same thing that Ms. Sharon had just mentioned. Um, we're dealing with an illness as well. Can- just like cancer, just like diabetes, just like any other disease, I like to use illness. But right. any type of other illness out in the world, we're living with it just as much as there are. Mm-hmm. But ours, we don't get as much as a push to do walks and do uh, videos I mean commercials type of anything it just seems like we're overlooked and like our pain is just as meaningless like it's not even there Mm -hmm. so it just to me push more on that we're still living with this day by day Mm -hmm. everybody else is going on with their life they're getting their there's out on the radio there's out on TV there's you go see billboards everything you walk past a newsstand there's some in the news about breast cancer we don't see we can look through any daily newspaper you, there's very little chance that you will find something there with sickle cell mm-hmm. so That's just right. bring it to him that we have there's something to constitute about sickle cell but it's not pushed as much as any other illness and it just to me just make sure that that's plugged in all these social sites and everything else just as much as any other illness right okay So let's talk about beating sickle cell, really talk about it. I believe that for each of us, getting through each day is a minor triumph. Every day, for anybody, sickle cell, no sickle cell, just getting through the day is a triumph. But I think that for sickle cell patients, getting through each day is actually a major victory. What is it about you that makes you able to claim these victories day by day, Darrell? To me, um, it's pretty much knowing that I actually have to do another, another day of having less pain or not being in pain at all so much. 
being able to just get up and go outside and not knowing well knowing that my body is pretty much okay and I won't go into a crisis later on tonight just certain things and certain aspects that I look at that as if I didn't have sickle cell made me feel a lot better because I'm actually able to do them and not having to worry not ha having less stress being more happy certain things like that just makes me a more makes my day a lot greater that I actually went through a whole nother day without stress without pain without another hospital visit so things like that it's just what makes it more vigorous for me especially knowing that the type of pain that I have that's all the strength I need right there because and I guess anybody living with sickle cell, that's sickle cell strong right there. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Like, that's the strength of Hercules to me, strength right. of Superman. Right. You know, you live with that and you actually can get through with the pain. Mm -hmm. That's something, a miracle. That's really amazing for me. In one of my closing remarks on one of the previous shows, I, I mentioned that there are a lot of superstar athletes that are MVPs and everything. And I bet you a lot of them couldn't take the pain you take mm -hmm. every day. I really believe that. And I think that that's something people ought to pay attention to. Sharon, what about you? What is it that makes you able to claim your victories day by day? Well, um, for me, my belief, uh, the belief in God that I have, and um, my belief in prayer, and the support that I have, uh, those are the things. And my children, you know, my family, um, the groups of people that help uplift me, I think those are the things that help me get through my day and make me feel victorious um, with without that I think if I didn't have the the support um, you know from the from my family and from the my friends and my church family I think that um, my faith would be a little low and I think without that I would I wouldn't survive I don't think that I would survive and then I have to believe in myself too you know and each day that I look at what I've gone through the day before, I think that helps me to keep going. If I if I could go through this yesterday, oh, I can make it today. Right. And each day it gets a little bit easier and easier and easier until after a while. I mean, that's your thought process. You know, that's your thought pattern. You think about, oh, I did this last week. Yeah, really? I was in a crisis last week. Look at me today. You know, I'm doing this. And I think each time that I go through a crisis and I have my down moments, that just gives me much more power and much more strength to know that I can face whatever else that I have to come in the future. And I'm just looking at you thinking that is awesome. What you just said is awesome because part of what you're saying is that each one of these events, these crises, mm -hmm. builds your confidence. It does. It does, because, I mean, if you think about everything that you've gone through, the pain, number one, the medications that you've taken, and, you know, you got to think about while you're under those medications, you're not yourself. Then you think about coming out of the medications, and right, you're having to that. go through the withdrawals, and you're having to fight again. So you fight in the crisis, you fight during the medications, you fight after the medications, you know, and it's, it's a non, it's, it's just non-stop. But then at the end of the day, you lay back and you think about everything that you've conquered, you know, and then the next day you wake up and you've got, hey, I can do I this. I can do this. Yeah. I can do this. Right. I went through all of that yesterday and I'm still here. I can do this. I can do this. And so that's, I think, you know, that is my That is, is a message that, from. you know, continues to, needs to be uh, continually repeated. You know, mm -hmm. you can do this. You've already done it. Mm -hmm. And you've proven that you can do it. So right. have the confidence that you can do this. What about um, any heroes or people that either that, that you, either of you look up to to help you maintain your determination and strength? Or is there anybody that's a hero? Sharon? I have a lot Heroine of or hero? <laughs> I have a lot of heroes and heroines, you know. Um, my parents were my first. Okay. And they were the first people that I knew and the first people that said, um, you're going to be okay. You're going to make it through. Mm -hmm. um, so they were my biggest supporters and my biggest fans, and I look up to them. You know, I looked up to them when they were living mm -hmm. and the strength and support that they gave me, and even though they're gone, that still lives inside of me. So I don't. Th no one can take that part away. Mm -hmm. um, my church family. Mm -hmm. I look at um, 
other patients that um, have sickle cell. Mm -hmm. I, I watch them and I watch, you know, how they interact and what they do on a daily. And a lot of times, even though I've gone through something similar, I can look at them and I can always say, God, thank you, you know, for what I have gone through. And maybe what I've gone through, I can share with them to help them get through what they're going through. So a lot of times that in itself helps me too. Um, and even just watching them and their strength, you know, that just gives me strength to keep fighting, to keep fighting, you know. Well, you just keep hitting it right on the head, you know, keep hitting the nail right on the head. And Darrell, what about you? Do you have any heroes? Mine is pretty much the same as Ms. Sharon's, from my family to my sons and my best friends, pretty much other sickle cell patients, they really give you the strength to keep going. They actually give you the, I guess you call it, the warrior momentum to keep pushing. Right. That's really the most thing you can. I can actually go through. I actually did have one superhero, I guess I would say I looked up to, which was like, I guess you would call him Superman okay. to me. Okay. Because his only thing he, um, only weakness he had was his crypt, was his kryptonite. Mm -hmm. To me, I guess my kryptonite is in my bloodstream. It's my sickle cell. But interesting way of looking at it. Without that, still keeps me going. Right. Like there's no way I will let somebody bring my kryptonite to actually bring me back down into my weakness. Mm -hmm. So knowing that I had the actual strength to keep going and the sickle cell strength, I'm not going to stop. So. So another tip that's come out of this piece of the discussion for helping people beat sickle cell every day get to know other sickle cell warriors absolutely hang out with them that's talk right. to them and build your confidence together that's right. um, but seeing that level of warrior strength as you said Darrell that warrior strength that can only reinforce the strength that's already in you so let's encourage that where people with sickle cell actually, you know, befriend and bond with others with sickle cell. And then what about faith? Does that play any role in helping you to continue your battle and achieve your victories? You both sort of mentioned it. Darrell, what about you? This is the biggest thing you have to do. You have to believe in faith. You have to believe in your faith in yourself. You have to believe in the faith in God. You have to believe in the faith of supporting from others. So okay. faith does a major part of a vic it gives a major part of a victory for me okay and miss sharon well it definitely plays a, a role for me and i think that is um the biggest role for me besides my parents um definitely having faith if you don't my mother used to say if you don't believe in something you'll fall for everything <laughs> and that's the truth so um you know, as we fight this daily, we have to have something to believe in. And my faith in God is what I do believe in. Mm -hmm. And I believe in people, too. So, you know, um, people are good. We're supposed to be good anyway. But um, I think that these are just, my faith is, is what strengthens me. That gives me the most strength every day. So both of you imagine that you had a chance to talk to a group of young boys and girls at a camp for kids with sickle cell. We have those. Mm -hmm. There's several of them around the country. Right. What would you tell them to keep them motivated to grow up and be strong sickle cell warriors like you two? Sharon? I would just tell them to um, stay positive, um, keep fighting, don't give up, um, surround yourself with people that are supporting you. Uh, make sure that, you know, you do uh, what you know you need to do to keep yourself as healthy as possible, like resting, uh, taking breaks, you know, those type of things that may seem minor to someone else, but these are things that can help us. Maybe um, laying down for an hour or two may give us five more hours of strength, you know, so uh, or may um, taking a day to rest instead of going out to play or something else may keep you, you know, may lessen one or two days off a hospital visit. So these are things that, you know, I would encourage them to do. And listen to your parents, you know, just if they've got, you know, they're telling you what's best for you to keep you as healthy because they don't want to see you sick either. So mm. that, that's what I would be encouraging. And Darrell, you, you, you're speaking to a group of boys and girls. What would you tell them? 
Uh, I've definitely been through actually having sickle cell, so knowing that I you actually have is not you're not living with it alone. Mm -hmm. There are other sickle cell patients. You just have to reach out for them. Right. They're gonna reach back. Mm -hmm. It just keep looking, uh, keep looking for them. Uh, keep a positive circle. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be the biggest thing, mm -hmm. um, yes. along with your support, because positivity around you will keep a lot of your stress level down. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that is pretty much the biggest thing, just positive and be stress-free. Um, as long with Miss Sharon, say uh, with your parents, they're going to look out for you because I know mine sh most certainly did. It's mm -hmm. like they're an advocate until you can speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. But if they don't know you're hurting or anything else or along with anyone, no one can help you. Mm -hmm. You have to be the biggest advocate to let someone else know so that they can help you going from there. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. Um is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't already discussed, Darrell? Well, there's definitely a lot of support groups. So for people to get a hold of them, make sickle cell actually out there as big as any other illness. Make that the biggest thing as far as, especially since it's Black History Month, and not just because it's Black History Month. It, but uh, sickle cell touches all races. Yes. So just because it's known, I guess, for mostly African Americans, it's not just touching African American families. It touches everybody. You just might not know it. Mm -hmm. So be the biggest thing to be a voice for sickle cell advocates. Help find some way to help put back in the community to help sickle cell patients. Right. Um. We are definitely thankful for the caregivers that we do have that are actually amazing. Like I'm so thank you for my mom because she's one of the biggest advocates for me, and she's in healthcare, so that makes it oh, so much mm -hmm. easier for me. Right. But not other uh, everybody is as blessed as me to actually have that mm -hmm. arm. Mm -hmm. So for those who aren't, definitely get in touch with any anyone is uh, possible to be able to get out some type of help because okay. we'll definitely help you out. All right. And Sharon, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, Darrell, I absolutely agree with you. Definitely. Um, and for definitely, you know, make sure you listen to your parents because they are your big, biggest advocate. Um, and one of the things that I want to say is um, if you have any negativity in your life, anything negative, any negative forces, negative people, sometimes it's, it's not a bad thing to say, I don't want to do this or I, you know, just can't do this, do that. walk away. Because um, our stress levels are so, you know, easily pushed to a higher level that I just think any negative forces, you know, just the slightest little bit a lot of times can just throw us in crisis. We've got to live with this the rest of our lives. Um, they're finding ways to cure. and um, But until... One day somebody walks in and says, hey, we've got a cure, and we all can go stand in line and get this cure. Until then, we have to find ways to manage this. So make sure that you surround yourself with positive people. You touched on that a lot, Darrell. Definitely surround yourself with positive people because those are the people that are going to keep you uplifted. They're going to keep your spirits high. They're going to keep your stress levels low. And you're going to do better in the long run. Um, Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, I hope that you um – agree with me that you've been listening to two very special strong sickle cell warriors who are beating sickle cell day by day we'd like to thank sharon hatcher hutchinson for being here with us and sharing of herself for the good of others and we also would like to thank mr darrell harris for being here with us sharing himself for the good of others um it's great great show thank you both um you know Someone once said a good decision is based on knowledge and not on numbers. The person that said that was named Plato. Plato was a philosopher in ancient Greece. He was the founder of the Academy in Athens, the first institution of higher learning in the Western world. He also is widely considered to be the most important person in the history of the development of Western philosophy. One of the most exciting things happening in the field of sickle cell is the ever-growing attention it is receiving from the scientific community. Never before have we seen so many studies and published papers emerging into the mainstream for consumption by doctors, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and yes, people like you and me. 
It is thrilling to see this much attention because it means that society is being made more and more aware of this disorder that affects millions of people around the globe. I think this means that we are on the verge of seeing a very different and improved world for those living with sickle cell. The fact that so many researchers and scientists are working on sickle cell and then telling the world about their findings is important for many reasons. Sickle cell is a complicated illness, but it is also quite possibly an easy disorder to fix. If you've read any of the emerging papers about gene editing, you'd know that it appears that the sickle gene, the hemoglobin S gene, can be found and corrected much like how Microsoft Word uses search and replace. Of course, the procedure is much more technical in nature. There is a lot of promise with this research because it has the potential to open the floodgates to the cure for many, many people. There is still much research to be done, though. That's why I encourage the scientists and the researchers to keep going. I want them to learn everything they can about sickle cell. I hope that you do, too. Once these researchers have completed their studies, they share the knowledge they gained in various medical journals and research papers. Some of the researchers work for universities, some of them work for some pharmaceutical companies, some of them work for hospitals. Honestly, it doesn't really matter to me where they work, as long as they keep studying sickle cell. It's the least that needs to happen after over a century of general neglect, don't you think? Anyway, I publicly applaud these scientists and researchers, and I want them to know that I and many, many others appreciate them for the work that they are doing. Much of the information that comes from scientific research studies is presented in very technical terms. A lot of it also contains a lot of numbers. That's important because numbers, perhaps more than anything, drive most decision-making decisions in our world today. Of course, it's the money numbers that drive the most decisions, more so than any other number. The money always, almost always seems to win the argument. Fortunately, our world is now finding out that there is a tremendous market for sickle cell related therapies and, and products. That's because they have found out that there are many, many, many millions of dollars to be made. Certainly not everybody is in it for the buck. There are some real humanitarians involved, and I applaud them too. Those who are working on sickle cell research are crunching numbers, and they are gaining knowledge. But we also want to remind society that more knowledge about helping real human beings on the individual level is needed too. We need more knowledge at the social services level. We need more knowledge at the policy making level. And most importantly, we need more knowledge at the primary and secondary care levels. You know, it's been said that something you don't know can't hurt you. But here's the problem. That something that a doctor or nurse doesn't know can hurt you. Like Plato said, a good decision is based on knowledge and not on numbers. We still have work to do, but we're getting there. That's our show for today. Please join us again next week.